So I'm not sure who was here last time, but we did speak about assignments. So usually when you hear assignments, you think, oh, this is not meant to be one of those ones. It's meant to be something that is fun, something that you are enjoying and you're doing it together. We're not expecting any sort of rigorous academic style of research. No, we don't want to fall asleep. We deal with like we deal with like rigorous academic boring stuff all day every day so we want yours to be fun colorful interactive and you can present it as you please but basically um depending on um the number of young people that we have you know i can caroline and um ashley you know will put you all into groups and think of an issue you know that either you have faced or you know someone that has faced an issue, it could be related to racism. Um, um, and look at how you can use the learnings from the sessions, how you can draw upon your cultural capital, how you can draw upon, let's say, the items we spoke about in the empowerment talk. You know, is there anything to, to, to pick up from the poverty, poverty talk that um, 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 we had? And, in the next few weeks, you'll also have a talk by Derek Cook, Derek Cook, Derek Cook, who is the director at Canadian Poverty Institute, and and he will talk about advocacy, how you can advocate for yourself. And so we really want you all to put all of these pieces together, and talk about, you know, how you can address racism and or navigate the system to overcome racism and be empowered to thrive and be successful. And so, da, 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 da. and so key tips, so it can be like, well, what is the issue? Is it racism? Maybe you don't even want to look at racism directly. Maybe you want to look at bias in the mental health system. Maybe you want to look at um, um, intersectionality between poverty and racism or intersectionality between poverty and the legal system but whatever issue you know what is that burning issue that you have or you have faced or you know that someone has faced how does it manifest give me some examples how has it affected you how has it affected your family how has it affected the community how has it affected young people in general how has it affected black people in general provide some examples why does it exist or persist? Why? Is it an individual problem? Is it a systemic problem? Is it a community problem? Is it all of the above? Why does it exist? Or why does it continue to persist? <laughs> Can't get my words out today. Why does it continue to persist? And then you think about, well, now that we know what it looks like, we know why it's happening, what can we do to address it or to manage it? What is the, and in everything that you're doing, I want you to think about what is the role of the individual? What is the role of the community? And not that I'm saying the responsibility lies with you, but how can you advocate for yourself? Um, what is the role of the community? Community can be this group right here. Community can be the Congolese um, community. Community can be black community. Community can be young people community. And you can look at another level, you say, well, what does it look like in terms of policies? What policies need to change? Or what do we need to do? Do we need to advocate at the city level, at the provincial level? And so like in really understanding that assignment, think about these key questions. What is the issue? Why does it manifest? Why does it exist or persist? And what can we do to address and or manage that issue? And in that, draw upon the things we covered in empowerment, the things we covered in um, cultural capital, the things Derek will go through in terms of advocacy. And if there's ever, let's say a time where you're like, oh, I don't remember, you know, I think Ike has, ha has these recorded and I will try, I won't try, I will send you my notes um, and I'll also connect with the other panelists that we've spoken to um, um, to see if they can send us their notes so that you can draw upon these notes, draw upon the video. And even if you can't be bothered to watch it all, just be like, hey, Nketi, you mentioned something about so, 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 and so, can you clarify? And I'll be happy to do that. And um, yeah, think about where you're gonna get your sources from. Are you gonna get them from YouTube? Are you gonna get them from 
Calgary Herald? Are you going to look at peer reviewed stuff? Again, we want it to be fun. So we don't want you to like, I mean, if that's your thing, you're into reading um, peer reviewed academic stuff and you want to read 10 and analyze it, hey, go ahead. But we're not expecting that at all. But, um, you know, I think we went through what credible sources are. So, you know, use some credible sources to put that together. Um, you know, another tip, have an introduction, background. Um, what are the aims of the project? How, do, how did you do it? Did you have interviews? How many people did you speak to? Did you look at documents? What documents did you focus on? Um, what did you find? Um, and then have recommendations and things like that. Yeah, so use visuals, tell a story, include quotes if you had interviews, but ensure anonymity. Don't be like, the director of this organization said this. <laughs> I mean, even though it's just amongst ourselves, you know, when doing research, it's most of the time it's advised to use anonymity and make if it's a, you could have a rec recording. I mean, we are completely open. You can be a presentation, whatever, just make it fun. I don't know what fun is. I'm boring. I just write reports and make presentations. So if you want to go outside of that, you are completely welcome. And yeah, and ask others to critique your work, you know, say, hey, if it's a presentation, you say, hey, check my presentation. If it's a recording, hey, it can even be a play, some sort of artistic play-ish kind of thing, you know, like a drama, you know, just make it fun so that people learn from you, but we're also um, entertained and we get to have a good idea in terms of how, how, what you've learned and what you even plan to do, you know, going forward. So I think I'm just at seven minutes, so I'm going to stop. And I think I'll stop sharing. Does anybody have any quick questions? And then I'll let um, um, Camille take over. No, okay. Well, if you do, I'm gonna put my email in the chat. Don't hesitate to reach out at any time, okay? Ike. All right, I think we're good. Uh, welcome Raisa and Afo joining us a bit late, but welcome. And then yeah, over to you, Camille. I think I have uh, everyone able to share now. So if you have a presentation, you'll be good to go. Is everyone able to see that? <laughs> okay. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just a brief introduction. My name is Camille and I am the student recruitment advisor for community engagement with the undergraduate recruitment team at the University of Calgary, uh, which works within uh, the, broader, the broader admissions and recruitment office uh, within the registrar's office. Uh, and just a little bit about myself. I am a recent graduate of the University of Calgary, uh, where I completed uh, a B Bachelor of Arts uh, majoring in political science with a minor in law and society. I graduated in June of 2020, um, just in the thick of the pandemic. So I did not imagine that that's how I would end my degree, but nevertheless, I'm, I'm glad we were able to make it through. I did just want to preface before I begin uh, that I am going to try to expand and make this presentation uh, as broad and as applicable to other facets of education and, and scholarships. But I know that I will be, since I am at the University of Calgary and that's where my expertise is, I'll be drawing a lot of, of examples from the University of Calgary. Um, but hopefully it will help spark ideas that perhaps you uh, haven't thought about before uh, that you can then expand into uh, other, other institutions maybe that you're, you're considering or other programs. Um, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll also make sure that we have some time at the end for a Q and A or just to have a more general conversation after this presentation. So let's go. 
Okay, um, so before anything, I'd like to respectfully begin with a territorial acknowledgement. Uh, through our indigenous engagement strategy known as El Tapito, which refers to a place to rejuvenate or re-energize during a journey, the University of Calgary as an educational institution communicates its commitment and indeed its responsibility for truth and reconciliation. Uh, I highly encourage you to visit ucalgary.ca slash indigenous to learn more about El Tapito and the history of the land we are privileged to call home, but of which we are also visitors. Uh, with that said, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy comprising the Siksika, Pekani, Kainai First Nations, as well as the Zotina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, which includes the Chiniki, Bear Spa, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Okay, so we will begin with some of the frequently asked questions about different credentials um, in post-secondary. Um, as you can see here, what is the difference between university credentials? But I wouldn't necessarily say just university credentials, but post-secondary more broadly. Uh, so it could be from a range, for instance, like a certificate, which is something that is typically completed uh, within a year or less. And this uh, typically focuses on a training for a particular skill or vocation. So some common examples could be something like a health care aid certificate. Uh, it could be something like a dental assistant certificate. So these are typically completed in about a year or less and catered towards uh, training for a specific uh, vocation or uh, job. And then we have diplomas, which are typically completed in about two years. And diplomas really cover a lot of technical aspects, again, training for a specific skill. So something like the trades, um, that's an example of a diploma, or um, we have something like the licensed practical nurse, the LPN program at Bow Valley, which is also a, a diploma. Uh, and then we have applied degrees and bachelor's degrees, which are completed in typically four years, uh, depending on how many courses or the course load that a student takes. And bachelor's degree are sometimes they're referred to as undergraduate students. So we have undergrad, which typically refers to bachelor's, bachelor level studies. And then we have master's degrees, which is completed after an undergrad. And then after a master's degree, you can choose to pursue a PhD or a doctoral degree. And that typically uh, includes a, a research area of focus uh, that you can master and concentrate in. So those are some of the differences there between post-secondary credentials. Now, other common questions are about the differences between majors, minors, and combined degrees. So when we refer to something as a major, it means that a large, uh, specialization or concentration of the courses that you're taking is in that specific major. So for instance, for me as a political science major, most of the courses that I take within my degree are political science courses. And um, for example, now with minors, those would be other courses that you can still have a concentration in, but it's not, the number of courses that you take is not as many as in your major. So it still allows you for to give a little bit of a concentration in a specific area, uh, but not perhaps not as uh, not as many courses as it would be in your major. But it still gives you a good taste for for what those courses are in that you're interested in. Uh, combined degrees, on the other hand, are degrees that are when you graduate, you can have you graduate with two different degrees. So. For instance, you could do a, a combined degree in Bachelor of Commerce and a bachelor's degree in engineering. So this is typically completed in at least five years, but when you graduate, then you, you will have two bachelor's degrees. So a bachelor's of commerce and a bachelor's of engineering, for example. 
Oh, sorry. Another thing that is not listed here is what we call an honors degree. Um, it's typically a further special further specialization of a bachelor's degree, uh, which often requires a thesis project completed at the end of the degree. So research is a huge component of honors degrees. Uh, and at, at the University of Calgary, some programs such as our Bachelor of Health Sciences is uh, an honors only degree. So you can only complete that program uh, through uh, if, you per if you're completing an honors degree. Uh, this is just a, a brief introduction to the University of Calgary, um, where we typically uh, give a brief overview of the university, but I think for our purposes today it would be also beneficial to uh, expand and talk a little bit more about what are some factors that you may want to consider when you when you're selecting what institution. Um, that you should attend. So for instance, um, you may want to consider if the institution that you're attending has a particular uh, program area of strength or, uh, or is that university known for a particular, a particular thing. So for instance, uh, University of Calgary is known as Canada's Entrepreneurial University. So there's a huge emphasis for innovation, um, the generation of uh, ideas, creativity. Uh, I believe since 2017, there have been over 390 uh, inventions and in innovations that were born out of the University of Calgary. Uh, it's also a research university, so there's a lot of intensive research um, that is going on and is emphasized um, in our curriculums. But some other factors too that I would personally consider like for me, <laughs> uh, I'm from Calgary. This is where I grew up. My family lives here. Uh, I considered going to other universities as well, but uh, having my family around and having a good support system was really important for me because I, I knew that this next step uh, in my education was going to be challenging. So it was important for me to consider where is my support system gonna be? And, um, you know, recognizing that it, it may be a challenging transition, where am I gonna feel most comfortable and, and supported? So that's one other thing um, to consider. And of course, the cost, uh, which we will talk about uh, more further into the presentation. Um, and But those are some of the things that you could think about. Now it's, I would also say that student experience uh, is a big factor too that you should consider and not just about what kind of student experiences am I gonna be engaging in as a student, but also just more broadly about um, the way that I think about in my own personal journey in education is I saw, saw post-secondary or my time at university as something like a vehicle that would help get me to where I want to be or a goal of mine, whether I wanted to learn something in particular or a specific career that we're, we're looking into. But just like, a, just like a car, you know, there are university or, or your education has multiple components. Some are given, uh, for example, like in a car it's given, you're gonna have some sort of steering mechanism. Um, or like a propulsion system. I would say it's the same thing too um, when you're pursuing uh, university because there are some things that are already a given, right? Like you would be getting an education, you would be um, writing research papers, for example. Um, those things are already given, but I would really encourage um, everyone who's looking into, or not just even looking into university, but just more generally uh, in life to look at it from a, from a bigger picture in terms of how can I enhance this experience? So not just about getting to where I want to be, but how can I make the journey um, more exciting? Maybe how can I uh, make it more meaningful? So for instance, uh, you know, it's given that it's gonna be, there are gonna be challenging moments, um, but 
who, who do I have or what friendships or what relationships have I built that will help me get through that, that will help me to um, be more motivated or that will help comfort me as I work through this, through this journey. So for example, um, when I first joined university, I actually came from a small high school and I knew just a handful of people from my high school that attended uh, the university. So I remember those first days of, of university just feeling very difficult and, and, and lonely. But ultimately, I would say that we have to try as, as, as difficult as it may be sometimes. I, I guess it comes more naturally for some people and for, for others it might might be more challenging, but to really um, start to get out of your comfort zone. And I know that that's often a buzzword, but it really is. I remember feeling very uncomfortable um, in my first few days of, of university, but, you know, and I, I remember in just reaching out to uh, clubs. Clubs Week is, for example, a big event that we host where all of the clubs on campus have an opportunity uh, to have a booth and reach out to students uh, so they can learn more about the different clubs that we have on campus. So that's actually where I met most of my friends. Um, it's also one of the easiest way to make friends just because you already have that shared or common interest. Um, and so Clubs Week or joining a club, which we have over 300 clubs on campus. And if you find that the, the thing that you're interested in is does not yet have a club. Um, certainly starting a club uh, is something that you could consider. So clubs week, we also have different students union events like pet therapy if uh, you're interested in petting some dogs while, uh, sorry, <laughs> petting some dogs as, oh, I'm sorry during like a stressful time maybe, or if you just happen to pass them by, um, it's a great way to relax after. Sorry, I'm having some trouble. Uh, you could also consider going to different sports games uh, or joining faith and spirituality center events. So I would really encourage everyone to seek out different interests and opportunities while they're a student, I think that's a great way uh, to meet new people, build relationships. Uh, in many of these programs, there's also great personal and professional development opportunities. So yes, while you're in school, you do wanna be thinking about performing well academically, but also think about how can I enhance my experience while I'm here. I just mentioned clubs, so we have over 300 student clubs on campus. Um, this is a QR code here that if you scan, it'll actually take you for a whole uh, list of clubs that we have on campus. All right. uh, some things that you could also think about are different facilities and amenities uh, on campus that you might be interested in partaking in. So things like the fitness center uh, at the University of Calgary, we're also really lucky because we have uh, the Olympic Oval where the 1988 Winter Olympics was held. So we do get a lot of athletes um, training at the University of Calgary just from all sorts of different countries. So that's really cool. Uh, we have intramural sports team. So, uh, you know, it's also another great way to meet people from different faculties who you may not necessarily have a lot of opportunities to meet otherwise. And sports clubs, that's also something that you could look into. And I did just wanna um, share this in case anyone is interested in becoming a varsity athlete with the University of Calgary. Um, so we have different varsity sports, for example, football, swimming, basketball, uh, you can head over to godinos.com and you can actually find out more information on the recruitment process uh, if that's something that you're interested in. And yeah, we have a great dino spirit on campus. So if that's something that interests you, feel free to check that out. Another opportunity, perhaps this is probably my favorite slide in the entire presentation. Uh, study abroad is 
or was a big part of my life when I was a student. And this is something that I would also encourage uh, students who are interested in, in going to university to really consider. Um, you only pay, well, at least at the University of Calgary, you only pay your University of Calgary tuition and fees when you study abroad. So it's not like you have to pay an additional tuition and fee at the partner institution that you will be attending. So that's, um, that's a great way to actually sometimes uh, it might be even cheaper depending on where you go and, and what your living arrangements are. It might actually be even cheaper for you to, uh, you might end up saving some money when you study abroad uh, for a little bit, sometimes just with the way the cost of living is and how um, the currency is. Um, yeah, that is a wonderful opportunity that I would highly encourage everyone to look into. It's a great way to build intercultural capacity. And also if you're looking to maybe venture out and do something you haven't done before. I know personally, before I went on the study abroad, um, I've been living with my parents my whole life. I don't really, never really knew what it was like to live outside of, um, outside of the home that I grew up in. So this was a, a good way for me to also build some uh, independence. And what's great is we also have funding available for study abroad. So we have scholarships and funding available specifically for study abroad. And at the same time, you remain eligible for all other scholarships and funding that are available at the university, as well as student loans. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, we also have a big emphasis on work integrated learning. So what this means is just, we want to encourage our students to take the knowledge that they have in the classroom and really uh, apply them in, in the real world, whether it's you know a cooperative education, meaning that you have a work placement uh, that is actually a work uh, a work term means it's paid. Uh, it's a great way for you to have some professional experience um, and build up your resume, your professional development skills. Um, for some faculties like nursing practicum is what we would call them and they are actually mandatory. Um, and then for engineering and science, we have paid internships. There's just really a, a different, a number of different ways you can have uh, professional development experience or work experience before you even graduate. Um, and it's also a great way, again, for like paid internships and co-ops is a great way to help fund your education. Um, and so I would also encourage you to uh, consider these things when you apply for university and, and you begin your studies. Recent placements, a few examples, we have Garmin, Suncor, Amazon, uh, the UN Association of Canada. I have a friend who, who did an internship at the UN Association of Canada and um, she won't stop talking about it and I'm really jealous and I wish I had that opportunity. But um, yeah, that's one regret that I personally have is that I wish I had participated in some sort of co-op or internship uh, it's a great way to build your network, gain some work experience before you even graduate, but which I would say really helps when you do start looking for jobs after you graduate, because then you can, you know, show all of the skills that you've developed. And uh, yeah. Moving on. Camille, I was wondering, do you want to stop for a second and see if we have any questions? Oh, yeah, for sure. Does anybody have any questions or anything resonating with what Camille is saying? Uh, sorry, it's Ashley here. If nobody has any questions, I kind of wanted to just jump in and just um, kind of reiterate or uh, put a stamp on some of the things Camille is saying about clubs um, and even the recreational um, sports uh i think you know me too i had kind of the same experience camille did starting university and honestly my first year probably was really tough didn't really know anybody it was very lonely but um i joined the african students association and honestly i made friends there that i still have and hope to continue to have lifelong 
um, relationship. So I think it's, um, you know, it can be intimidating at times starting joining a new club or, you know, going up to people, meeting people, but it's um, so worth it. Just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, I, I also agree with Ashley. I, I joined a few clubs at university. Again, same thing. Some of them are still my friends, even though they've moved to different corners of the planet. They are still my friends. We're still staying in touch. And it really enhances your experience. And it's not just with, with obviously University of Calgary, like I said in the chat. I would say all universities have some clubs. And so if that's the route you want to go down, be sure to explore it. And it may, and it, there may be clubs, there may be things like Rotary, Rotaract. So um, keep an eye out for things like Rotaract. Rotaract is wonderful. They do a lot of community projects. You have an opportunity to meet with other, other um, let's say professionals who could offer you some sort of mentorship. And so essentially go to, like, I remember when I went to university, I went to play. I was excited for the parties. Everybody that went to universities had all these wonderful pictures on High Five. High Five was like, what? Anybody remember High Five? <laughs> high Five was like pre, 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 pre Facebook. <laughs> and so you'd see all these wonderful pictures on High Five, et cetera, et cetera. And I went to university to play. And, and, but have, you know, join these clubs, you know, with a bigger view, with a bigger goal, you know, and start sort of thinking, okay, well, what does, what, where do I want to go? And what does this mean? And what's my career going to look like? And don't, 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 don't go back to party like me. But yeah, so um, if no one else has anything else to add, Camille, can, can I, uh, can I actually just ask uh, Julie to jump in quickly? Julie, I know you're doing uh, your practicum right now and you, you went through MRU. Can you share a little bit about what your experience was? I know uh, uh, Camille kind of mentioned that before. Yeah, so um, the good thing about like having clinicals, so we call it clinicals instead of practicums because you're in the hospital um, doing basically like working with patients and doing what nurses would do on a daily basis. And like you're guided by a clinical instructor and it's like a really, it's a smaller group in clinical. So usually a group of six to, to seven students. So your instructor is able to supervise and support you way better than if you were in like a bigger group. Um, the only downside of it is you don't get paid for it, but it's really good experience and you get to, you know, work on different units. Um, right now I'm working on at Foothills on an oncology unit and you get to see just different diseases and how they manage, like when you learn about it in the text in class, in textbooks and stuff, and you learn about all these side effects and pathophysiology, it doesn't really make sense that much, but when you see it in real life, it all connects and it just makes, um, it makes things a lot easier to learn when you see it in person, for sure. Thank you, Julie. Uh, last oh, question. You. Sorry, I saw Linda, you have Calgary Dinos on your profile. Are you trying to get recruited for them? <laughs> I don't think she's here. You Linda. still there? Okay, maybe he's on mute. I'll send him a message, but I definitely got to get an answer about that. Okay, sorry, over back to you, Camille. Awesome, no, it's, it's great to hear uh, the different experiences and uh, what other people have, have to share. So that's awesome, thank you for sharing. Um, let's move forward here. This works. Another thing to keep an eye out for are the different student support that you have on campus. So these are all University of Calgary ones, but I'm sure at different institutions, there are also similar services that are offered. So keep an eye out for things like career services where they can offer support on um, creating resumes, maybe how to conduct an interview, different workshops for professional development, career advising, um, those are all really uh, important skills that you will, might want to look into. Um, there's also the Student Success Center, which offers things like writing support, academic advising. I also know that they do some tutoring for 
certain courses. So if you need find yourself uh, needing some help or, or guidance with the courses that you're taking, that's a good resource to keep in mind. Um, we also have things like student wellness services that offers different medical services or counseling, um, different learning opportunities uh, when it comes to things like handling stress or mindfulness. So these are all uh, great student supports to, to keep in mind. Uh, and these offices are really dedicated to ensuring that students get the support that they need. So I encourage you to familiarize yourself with these services and to reach out if you need help. Um, I will just mention international student services. If we have any international students, they offer immigration advising, um, transition support for international students. We have uh, many different programs like social events, just to, which is a great way for you to meet people, especially if you're new to the country and, and may not be uh, very familiar, not only with the campus, but with the city itself. So this is a, a, great, a great service that I would like to highlight. Moving on to programs. Okay. So at the University of Calgary, we have eight different faculties and more than 250 programs. Uh, and I'm sure at different institutions as well, there's gonna be a lot of different programs uh, that you will see. And so, just some resources that might help you uh, to sort of make a decision. I know it's very common for students to feel confused. Uh, maybe they're not sure what they wanna study or they've, they're interested in this one career they've heard of, but they're not necessarily sure what, what that entails. So there's a couple of specific uh, resources that I wanna highlight. Um, so here uh, we have degree profiles at the University of Calgary. I'll just click onto that. And on this page, you will actually see all the different faculties and the programs that we offer within that faculty. So for example, Faculty of Arts, Faculty of Kinesiology, Faculty of Nursing. And if you click on them, if you click on a program, for example, like computer science, it will give you a breakdown of what uh, the curriculum is or what they try to cover in that course, as well as some sample job titles uh, for people who have completed that degree before, some examples of careers that they have gone into. So uh, this is a great resource for you, maybe if you're already thinking about a specific program that you're interested in and you want to learn more about what um, what the content is of that program and maybe some examples of uh, industries or jobs that people who have completed that degree have eventually pursued and this is a great resource it also has further resources that are external to the university that you can certainly check out that are related to that particular degree so I would highly recommend that. There's a QR code on the side that I'll just go back to. And, and, and Camille, can anybody access this or do you need to have a University of Calgary account? Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. No, this is a uh, public information. You don't need any accounts. If you click this link or scan that QR code, it'll take you, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, to that page. Yeah. Right, so if you look at that page and you can see um, the kind of degree programs and the jobs or qualifications that they need for that, that can come out of, of that degree program, am I correct? Yes, yes, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah, and there's another resource here with a QR code, and I'll just click on this link. This is from Career Services. Uh, these are initial Calgary websites, but they also have embedded links and resources within these pages that are external to the university that you might find helpful. And for example, this one, we'll just let it load. Uh, 
Ah, it's not cooperating. <laughs> Let me try that again. So Rita, whilst um, 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 Camille's finding her dock, um, Rita's here, so um, she was stuck in traffic, unfortunately, but she's here. Um, carry on. I really wanted to show uh, this page because it did have some really interesting resources that I think are very useful. Okay. So that page leads us to a page in career services. Uh, so for example, you really want to do a lot more reflecting when it comes to um, choosing what program uh, or career that you would want to pursue. Um, and so here we just have different resources when it comes that will help you uh, or guide the way that you would explore this. So there are some embedded worksheets here or some things that they suggest that you think about. Um, but another thing that I wanna, sorry, I'm just find it. Okay, here in the explore, the explore section, under industries, we will also have occupational profiles. This is actually a government of Alberta uh, site that will list different occupations. Um, for example, if you just click all these different links here, uh, it'll guide you through different examples of different careers and occupations. And then most of them will have a description of what you know, the primary responsibilities of the occupation are, what kind of education uh, is needed to be able to, uh, to qualify for that specific job. Uh, so that's a great... I mean, is the screen meant to be changing because we can't see anything. Oh, really? Oh. No. Uh, how about now? I mean, we can see it, but are you meant to be... I, um, I feel like the way you're talking, it sounds like you are talking us through something but like you're oh. supposed to, yeah but not sorry. changing on the screen if that makes sense okay uh no i'm just right now on the on the general page okay uh, yeah sorry uh again i'll just show you so under the explore page or sorry under the explore section if you click on occupational profiles it'll take you here um and again, there's some featured occupations here, like if you're interested in becoming an administrative assistant, an agricultural equipment technician, a biostatistician, cardiolo cardiology technologist. So maybe I'll just, I'll click on, on one so you have an idea of what I'm talking about. Yeah. There you go. Same screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and then here you can see in this in this little tab here um, different facts about the specific career like average salary, average wage, the minimum education. You can see. Can anybody else see that? No. Maybe you need to stop sharing and start again. Okay. Let's try this. How about now? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. So I just click on cardiology technologist, one of the options that was featured there. Um, and here you can see things like average salary, average wage, minimum education. Um, they also have outlooks for different jobs, I guess, in terms of um, how they foresee this job's popularity or its prominence is in, in the future. Um, and then a general number of how many are employed in this specific occupation and whether it's in demand and says here, this is a medium demand, um, common terms, I guess, that they might refer to, like healthcare technologist, heart health technologist, medical technologist. Um, yeah, so this is a great page for you as well if you're still considering different occupations. And again, you can. Ask anybody, sorry, Camille, I'm so sorry for cutting off. Does anybody have an occupation they'd like Camille to check out?
<clears throat> Camille, you can just show us one more. Maybe nursing. Let's try. Okay. Let's try nursing. Okay. Let's see. Have you seen um, Reza's um, point? Mm -hmm. okay. So this is, I think they're broadly referring to it as nurse practitioners. Mm -hmm. And here it gives a, a description of what nurse practitioners are, uh, or what they typically entail. And then here are things like average salary, average wage, the minimum education. Um, that look for that specific career, the demand, then approximately how many are employed. Again, common terms. And this this page is by uh, the province of Alberta, so you can actually just straight access it by typing. Alice, so A L I S dot Alberta dot C A, and you can access this page, or through the through the QR code that I sent, um, where you can access this career wheel that will help uh, help you to think about what career options might be right for you. Um, there's a lot of different uh, links and resources here that you can check out. So going back to our presentation. Oh. Uh, let's move forward. This is a tool that anyone can access, right, Camille? Yes, yes. These are all open access. So in the next few slides, I'm just going to go over examples of different programs. Um, again, at the University of Calgary, we have these eight different, uh, eight different faculties, uh, and each faculty has a variety of different programs. I'll just move here. So things, for example, in the Faculty of Arts, um, these are the different programs that we offer. So political science, which is my major is in this faculty, uh, other programs like history, international relations, art history, film studies, um, communication and media studies, music, these are all under the Faculty of Arts. We have the Haskane School of Business where um, you can get a Bachelor of Commerce. So in programs like accounting, marketing, finance, international business. Um, and in the Faculty of Science, we have programs like biochemistry, computer science, environmental science, physics. And uh, at the Cummins School of Medicine, we have the Bachelor of Community Rehabilitation, for example. And then our honors only programs, like I mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation. So we have biomedical sciences, uh, health and society, bioinformatics. Then of course we have the faculty of nursing, uh, which offers the bachelor of nursing. We also have last but not least the faculty of education. This one has so many different possible combinations depending on what teachable uh, you're interested in pursuing, uh, or whether that's the elementary or the secondary route. So that's the faculty of education. And we have the faculty of engineering, faculty of kinesiology, and uh, common questions that we get. So there are students who are interested in professional programs. So for example, law and medicine, 
those actually require pre, uh, previous post-secondary study, uh, as well as admission tests like the LSAT and the MCAT. So you can't actually you can't actually go straight into law or medicine. You need to have a prior undergraduate program or some previous post-secondary study in order to apply to those programs, as well as to complete um, an admission test such as the LSAT or or the MCAT. So that's just something to think about if you're interested in pursuing those programs. Uh, now I will talk a little bit more about the admissions process. I know this is specific to the, to the University of, of Calgary, but I will try to also uh, expand this a little bit later on so that you just have a, a more broad and a general idea of what, of what an admissions process could look like. So at the University of Calgary, uh, we have what we call a rolling admissions, which just means that throughout the admission cycle, we are constantly reviewing applications. So it's not like everyone submits at, you know, at a specific date, and then we do all of the, then, then we all, then we do all of the evaluations after that. So it's, we're constantly reviewing students' files and throughout the admission cycle, you know, it depends on when you submitted your application and when you completed the admission requirements, that's when you'll typically hear back uh, from us. So it's different for everyone. It's not, it's not like everyone here is back at the same time. Um, and when it comes to that, we actually encourage all of our students to apply as early as possible. So the sooner that you have all of your applications in, the sooner you have your uh, required courses in, all of the admission requirements completed, and the sooner we can evaluate you. And that's actually to your advantage, especially because later in the cycle, um, it might mean that there are less seats uh, available. So the sooner you apply and the sooner that we can evaluate your application, um, then the better just in terms of seat availability. And you can apply for two programs in a single application. So you'll, you'll indicate like a primary program, which is one that perhaps you'd be most interested in. And then you can also indicate a second program, which uh, it could be a program that you're also just as interested in, but many students uh, who are eager, maybe they're really keen to join uh, university for that particular year. Uh, it could be a program that has a, has a smaller competitive average or a lower competitive average than your primary program of choice, just so you have a little bit of a, of a cushion between those two programs. And so as a general requirement, admission is competitive and it's based on five faculty specific subjects. So each program is going to have different requirements. I'm gonna have examples in the, in the next uh, few slides here just to help you uh, get a better idea but there are also some programs that will have additional requirements. So for example, the Bachelor of Health Sciences that requires a supplementary essay. Um, for programs in fine arts, such as dance and music, there are additions. Uh, for visual studies, there's also a, a portfolio requirement. Um, and at the same time, all applicants uh, must demonstrate English language proficiency. Most students uh, who studied in Canada fulfill this requirement if we can see that you've completed at least three years of, of education here. Um, but there's certainly other ways to meet uh, English language proficiency, for example, if you're an international student, but just something to keep in mind. So I'll just move on. Again, these are just different ways that the English language requirement could be met. Okay. Now, for example, a Bachelor of Arts in Law and Society, you'll see here you will need English at the grade 12 level, as well as three other approved courses, and then one other approved course or option. Uh, all of the approved course and uh, approved options is going to be on our website, as well as our view books. Uh, unfortunately, our view books right now are still being updated, but if you're interested, uh, I'll make sure to reach out to our, our organizers here um, to see if anyone is interested, then I can 
forward the, uh, you a copy once, once those are available and good to go. And again, for this, the estimated competitive average is mid 70s. Um, for other programs, for example, engineering, you can see there are different required courses. So these ones are more specific. Um, so the prerequisites for a Bachelor of Science in Engineering, for example, like English, pre-calculus, calculus, chemistry, or, and either physics or biology. And you can see the estimated competitive average is mid 80s. So really depending on what program you're interested in applying for, the prerequisites will be different as well as the competitive average. So something to, to keep in mind when you're uh, browsing through different programs. And if you're missing a course, there's a few different uh, ways that you can complete this requirement. So some people take an AP exam, sorry, this, some of this is more catered for international students or uh, students uh, outside of Alberta, but you can take an online high school course, for example, from a recognized curriculum. I know examples here in Calgary, uh, Bow Valley, they, have, they offer academic upgrading. Uh, I know SAIT offers academic upgrading as well as the University of Calgary. Um, through our continuing education program, you can also complete academic upgrading there. So there are ways for you to uh, complete missing courses that are required. And again, we just encourage everyone to take early action. So courses must be completed before the course can be used for the admission calculation. So I just encourage students to make sure that they have their required courses, know what their, first of all, know what their requirements are, make sure that you've uh, completed them or you're in the process of, of completing them and then apply for admission. Another one that I would highlight, so that's our standard process. There are also other ways that you may be evaluated. So we have what we call diverse qualifications. This is really intended for students who may have achieved excellence outside of academics, or perhaps they've faced significant hardship. Um, but ultimately, uh, we want to encourage high potential students uh, to seek admission to university. And uh, although, there may be some circumstances that have barred them or prevented them from uh, really being able to showcase uh, beyond grades what their strengths are. This is something that I would encourage um, those students to consider. Uh, all applications are evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. And the way this process works is we would first assess through the standard process, looking at the grades in the GPA. And then if you're not admissible through that route, then um, we would have a look at your file through diverse qualifications. So something to keep in mind. And I'll also just mention uh, adult student admissions uh, for students who are 21 years of age or older by the first day of classes, um, there may be modified admission requirements. So uh, for example, here uh, at the Haskins School of Business, you, instead of having five required courses, you will only need to present English 30-1 and Mathematics 30-1. Uh, you will still have to meet the competitive average, but it will be just based on these two courses instead of those five courses that would be um, typically required in the standard process. And this is just, there's a lot of different um, timelines here, but you know, just a, a brief uh, overview of the application process, you know, research different programs and what the requirements are, um, submit application, upload the necessary documents, or this is specific for the University of Calgary, but more or less, um, you can apply this to, to uh, other institutions. You know, we wanna make sure you're considering uh, different awards and scholarships and make sure that you check your to-do list if there's anything um, that you're missing and hopefully accept your offer by the end of it. Now let's move over to awards. Um, again, <laughs> these awards, this one is specifically for, for the university, but at the end I'll, I'll try to expand that a little bit. 
Um, so just before we begin, there's actually different kinds of awards. So for example, there's scholarships that are primarily based on academic merit. There are bursaries that are primarily based on demonstrating financial need. Um, and then just more broadly, awards of, that might have different requirements. For example, I know if you're a part or a member of a club, then they may also have specific scholarships for that club. Um, and so this is just a chart of a uh, summary of the awards at the University of Calgary that we offer. So we have what we call automatic awards, which you don't actually need an application. So after you apply and submit all of your uh, required documents, all of your transcripts, um, if, you meet, uh, if you meet certain grade threshold, then we will automatically grant you this award, you don't have to apply for it. Um, and the value is between $2,000 to $5,000. Again, uh, there's no application time commitment for this. All you need to do is apply for admission. And then we have what we call high school entrance awards, which you do need an application for. And the value is between $500 to $10,000. Um, March 1st is the deadline to to apply and the time commitment is about 15 minutes and it's you know you're just primarily selecting yes or no uh, it's like a questionnaire um, once or this is completed again after you apply so the high school entrance awards is actually you know over i think it's about a few hundred different awards that you only have to complete this one application for and then you get considered for all of those awards and then what we also have what we call prestige awards, which are our high value awards. And you will need to complete an application for this as well. And the application time commitment, typically a few hours, is there are some uh, essay questions uh, that are part of the application. And again, this is completed after you apply. So this is just an overview, and then we'll go on and see further into each of these. And the automatic admission awards that you don't have to apply for, they're called, uh, there's a couple of uh, different awards under the automatic admission awards. So we have the President's Admission Scholarship valued at $5,000, and it's for first year students with an admission average of 95 or greater. And again, you don't have to apply for this, but you will be notified from November to August. So whenever, whenever you receive your offer, um, and you will also hear in that time frame um, whether you've qualified for the president's admission scholarship. If you're taking an IB diploma, for example, um, there's also an entrance scholarship for that valued at $2,000. It's for first year students with an IB diploma score of 35 or greater and notified between February to August for those students. Camille, what is an, uh, an IB diploma? Okay, so the IB diploma is actually the International Baccalaureate Diploma. It is uh, a curriculum that students can opt to take at some high school. So it's a, it's a special curriculum. There's there's a lot of different curriculums that you, uh, that you may encounter. So there's the advanced placement AP, that's, that's a common curriculum. There's also uh, the GCE um, curriculum. So different parts of the world uh, will have different curriculums. And there's some international ones that are common in, in many different countries. So IB is one of them, AP, GCE, there's a lot of uh, different ones too. Um, but yes, IB is one of those uh curriculums that we have uh, an automatic admission award for and so as you are all applying well not all of you right now or um maybe some of you are already in um but you know keep an eye out for some i wouldn't even say keep an eye out. i would say look on the website for these scholarships and see which ones you could possibly apply for and then 
I'm sure there will be an, a, a, a scholarships um, advisor, seek them out, talk to them, you know, and explain which scholarship you're looking at and entry requirements and, and expectations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, oftentimes we as black people, we tend not to sort of explore these well enough and oftentimes there's lots of money that we can access that we don't access. So do explore it in whatever institution you find yourself in. So, yeah, sorry, come in. Camila, I had a quick question. Yeah. So it's possible for a person to get awarded both these um, automatic admission awards in one application, in which case a person gets like $7,000? Sorry, it's, I'm just trying to see if I understood it correctly. Are you asking, like, is it possible for someone to qualify for both of these awards? Yes, yes. Okay. So you are an IB student, but then your GPA is 95 or higher, and so you get both. Can that happen? Okay. Um, I, I don't believe it is because there are actually, for example, the IB, the IB they have a different... Um, they have a different admission requirement. So you would either be assessed as, as someone with an IB diploma or um, depending on your what your curriculum is, there uh, be different ways of, of uh, what the admission requirements are. And ultimately, uh, we'll, if you're an IB student, we'll be, lo you're, we'll be looking at your diploma score of 35 or greater. So we don't, IB students, they don't get like number grades they actually get scores of like the numbering is different so it wouldn't it wouldn't be um it wouldn't be possible that they would qualify at the same time just because we would if you're an ib diploma student then we would be going off of your diploma ib diploma score which is numbered you know differently than you know something out of like a hundred scale sorry if I'm, I'm not sure if, i hope that that answers your question. Okay. I'll just move forward here with our prestige awards. So again, these are our high value scholarships. Uh, Camille, there's a question from Julie. Oh, sorry. in the chat. Okay. Uh, is AP taken into account advanced placement? Um, Yes, AP is taken into account. I would, I'm honestly just not too sure what the specific uh, admission requirements are, but I can definitely look into that for you, um, Jolie. I will get in touch with you. Um, I will have to, to look into that. But yes, I know we have a lot of students who have completed EP. I will uh, reach out to you, Jolie. I'll make sure of that. Uh, again, prestige awards, so our high value scholarships. These are just some examples, um, <clears throat> but many of them are renewable. So you can see um, Leader in Health Sciences Scholarship that's renewable for four years. Um, the NLE Leader in Business Scholarship, valued at $20,000, renewable for four years. Uh, you will need to complete an application for the prestige awards, and typically the deadline is around December 1st. So something to keep in mind. And then I mentioned high school entrance awards, which you only need to complete one application to be considered for hundreds of different uh, high school entrance awards. So some examples here, the Costco Wholesale Canada Bursary, um, the Class of 1973 Engineering Bursary. Again, this the application takes roughly 15 minutes and just with that one application, you can be considered for hundreds of different awards. Um, and for the high school entrance awards, typically the application is due around March 1st. Are these just um, University of Calgary related ones or is this general ones? 
So the high school entrance awards is going to be a mix of um, external awards and internal awards. Uh, but just this, with one application, you can have access to that. I'll show um, in a couple of slides here um, where you can browse just specifically like external ones or specifically internal ones. We have a tool uh, for that. But yes, the high school uh, entrance awards that I'm referring to here is, is going to be a mix of internal and external awards. Um, yeah, and the Schulich Leadership uh, Schulich Leader Scholarship. This is uh, offered at 20 institutions across Canada, so not just the University of Calgary. Um, but how this works is a counselor at your high school um, can nominate a student. So if you're interested in the Schulich Leader Scholarship uh, and you're in high school, I would reach out to um, your guidance counselors. They are the ones who facilitate uh, who facilitates these uh, nominations for the Schulich Leader Scholarship. Um, and they give out $100,000 um, scholarship for engineering and $80,000 for other STEM programs. Um, and again, I mentioned they're offered at 20 institutions across Canada. And the nomination deadline is the end of January, typically. So if you're interested, if you're interested for the next uh, fall 2022 nomination deadline is January 2022. And you can learn about Schulich leaders. Sorry? I have a question for you. I know we have an engineering student, I believe, here. Oh, okay. Do you need to apply? Can you apply once you've started your degree, or does it need to be at high school level? Um, for this specific Schulich Leader Scholarship, this has to be at the high school level. So before you start your studies, um, okay. this is actually nominated by high school guidance counselors. So in order to be considered, you have to be nominated by a counselor from your school. So typically students uh, who are interested in this will reach out to their guidance counselors um, and discuss it further about what the guidelines might be for that. But yes, you do, you do have to be um, at the high school level for to be considered for the Schulich Leader Scholarship. All right, now external awards. So there's thousands of external awards that are available, so not just specifically to the University of Calgary. Um, some examples of award providers at like Universities Canada or the Calgary Foundation. Those are two um, examples of external awards providers. I will, okay, so this one is, I just wanted to show you another tool. Oh, sorry, let me go back. I think to stop sharing for a moment here. Sorry, that link is just not working, but I want to show this tool. I hope you can see this. If you just type ucalgary.ca slash awards and then click on search for awards, we have this tool. As you can see, there's over, over a thousand different scholarships that you can browse through. Um, and then here, there's a specific one here that you can toggle between internal, external, and government. Um, so for example, if I'm only interested in seeing external scholarships, I can filter that and then you can see there's 32 different external scholarships that you can look further into. Um, and then if you click on them, that tells you what the award value is, who the donors are, what the award description is. So you calorie.ca slash awards, and then you can see you can click search awards and then 
use this tool here. Um, 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 Camille, you have a question here. What are the differences between external, internal, and government? Okay, that's a great question. So internal awards means they are offered by the University of Calgary or the main um, funder is the University of Calgary. External awards just means that the the award is coming from an external group or organization. Um, and with that, it's likely that they also offer this award at other institutions. So if you're interested in um, perhaps studying at another institution and you want to know if you know that what what awards are available to you, like that's that's something that you could also look into as exter external awards, just so you have an idea. Um, of what kind of scholarships are out there. Government awards, those are funded by the government, um, whether it's provincial or, or the local or the federal government. Um, and again, if it's external or government uh, award, if it's an external or a government award, then it's also uh, likely that they are available at other institutions. So when I refer to internal awards, I primarily mean University of Calgary awards. Uh, yeah. And for government student loans, that's also an option. So student loans um, in Canada are administered by the province or your home province. And for example, here in Alberta, we have Student Aid Alberta. They're the ones who facilitate student loans. That's where you submit an application. Um, and if you scan this QR code, it'll take you to, to their website where you can learn more about student loans and access the application. So that's, again, another option. Here are just some <clears throat> suggestions in terms of path to pay for education. Um, it's always good to first develop a financial plan, come up with different ways that uh, you can fund your education, find out more about tuition and fees and the cost um, that you will incur. Then think about, for example, parental contributions, or if you have a support network that can help pay for your education, start to think about that. Then attend an awards info session or webinar. So at the University of Calgary, um, we offer webinars and info sessions about awards where you can learn um, tips and advice on uh, how to find awards and applying for them. Uh, and then actually applying for awards, like the entrance awards. Then once you start classes, you can think about how can I make money from a, from a part-time job? Maybe you're working a part-time job on campus while you're studying. That can also help fund your education. Um, we also have money smart seminars at the University of Calgary. And basically the, the, this webinar or the seminar is intended to um, teach students a little bit more about uh, financial, financial literacy and all that good stuff. Then you can apply for continuing student awards once you're a student and you're continuing under your education. And then you can apply for co-ops, internships, and other paid research opportunities. So these are just some, uh, some things to think about when it comes to funding your education and investing in your future. Now, these are just important dates and timelines. If you are interested in applying for the fall 2022 or the September 22, September 2022 intake at the University of Calgary, um, applications will open on October 1st later this year. Um, and then you can see awards deadlines. So for prestige awards, deadline for uh, applications is December 1st. Um, 
December 15th is the deadline to submit all of the necessary documents um, for the procedure wards. And then March 1st is the application deadline. So March 1st, 2022 is when the application will close. And uh, as we near the end here, I just... Uh, sorry, can, I, can I interrupt you for a second? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, okay. so, so Rita says, how can our participants get notifications about the award webinars? Okay, um, I will actually, I will forward you a link um, that'll give you uh, an access of like the different schedule of, of events that we might host. Um, I don't have it on me right now, but I will send it to the facilitators or the organizers to make sure that um, those who are interested can have access to that. Um, and here again, just as we near the end, uh, the University of Calgary will be having an open house in person on October 2nd uh, from 10 to three. Um, there we will have campus tours, faculty fair. So if you're interested in learning more about a specific faculty, you will have the, the opportunity to um, get in touch with representatives from different faculties to learn more about their programs. Um, there will also be discovery sessions um, that will help to um, explain further the different programs, the different um, facilities and services that we have on campus. So that is going to be on October 2nd. And then here's just uh, my information and different ways that you can connect with me and with us, uh, the broader team at the University of Calgary. Um, so my email is community.liaison at ucalgary.ca. We also have an Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. So this YouTube channel is a great resource. Um, maybe if you're looking to explore further to some of the things that I touched on today, um, you can replay that there. We also have a Choose You Calgary podcast where every every episode every episode we're covering a different topic or a different service on campus, which is a great way to learn more about the different services and programs that we offer. Um, again, if you have questions, you can ask me now, or if you'd like to book a one-on-one -on -one session, you can also um, send me an email. Uh, I will I will send. Um, resources on the webinars that's been requested. And I will follow up with Jolie on her question about AP. Um, I'll make sure we have that covered. Um, but other than that, that is what I have for you today. Um, and if we wanna have you know, a Q&A, if anyone has any questions or just to have a conversation, happy to, happy to do so. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, truly do appreciate it. Uh, I think um, I will open it up for questions or maybe do a quick little round, get everybody to talk and then uh, we'll be able to close it off there. Sound good? Anybody have any questions coming to mind right now? No, 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 Are okay. Are any summer programs? No, someone asked if there's any summer programs. I'm not sure who's. It was me. It was Raisa. Okay. It was Raisa. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any summer programs? And uh, are the programs only for the people who want to attend U of C? Right. Um, so, summer programs, are you asking more like courses to take in, in the summer? Or are you looking, for example, like rec programs or specifically for courses that you might want to take yes yeah okay um so in order for you to take courses you will have to you know submit some sort of application so if you're not really looking to enter into a, de a degree program for, for example you're just interested in taking some courses that you're um you're interested in we have what we call open studies um and this allows you to 
take University of Calgary courses without necessarily being enrolled in a degree program. Um, so it's a great way, for instance, if you're interested in just taking a summer course, um, the only requirement I believe is that you need to have English 30-1. Um, I will send a, a link in the chat for you to look into that. Um, but yes, that, that is an option. All right, good, good. I think I'll go to Junior. We haven't heard from you today and we know you're thinking about uh, college and stuff uh, coming up. So uh, for you, what are the most important things when you're looking uh, into post-secondary? Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't exactly know what I want to like take, but um, when she was talking about like the sports programs and like what they have to offer there, I thought those were actually like really cool as well as like scholarships, like like the thought of being able to go to school without like, you know, necessarily paying full tuition. And um, basically for like schools that like on campus, like any type of school really like works well for me. Like whatever, if they have the program that I'm trying to take, like I'm, I'm, I'm willing to go, like if I can get a scholarship somewhere, that is, I'm willing to go there. Oh wait, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. No, I said good answer, and then I, 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 I was on mute there. I didn't, I didn't unmute myself. It was me. Uh, go to Jamima next. We know that you're transferring school, so you started your post-secondary journey here and going on to Montreal. Um, what kind of things factored into your decision there? Uh, was it the school, the program, the teachers, or like what were you thinking about when you're shifting from? Uh, a one system. And I know in Quebec, they do a lot of things way different. Even student loans is like a different story over there. So just want to know what uh, what factored into your decision making. Um, right. So first of all, for student loans, actually, um, I had to apply through the Alberta website, like through the Alberta student loans, because um, you know how like we have uh, student numbers here and stuff like that. You need that in Ont in Quebec too. So since I didn't do high school there, then I had to apply through here, but I could still get it even if I'm going to school outside of Alberta, which was still pretty cool because I didn't know. Like I thought when I saw that, like I needed the Alberta student number thing in Quebec. I thought like it was done. I'm not, I'm not getting help, but um, it's cool that like I can still apply through here, even though I'm not going to school here. Um, but unfortunately right now, like I'm not actually going into the program that I'm doing right now in Montreal. Um, but I feel like that's fine because I'm just planning on like continuing to move up and up. Um, and then I do eventually want to maybe go for a PhD in psychology. Um, so I already know it's going to be a, prog a process or like a long process. So I may as well just kind of um, stick through it and like see kind of what school or what city is best for what I'm trying to do and I guess also just being because I go to St. Mary's right now it's a really small school um, in Calgary and I don't really think it's that like I don't know I don't think the psycho psychology is like that big I guess so I think going to a bigger school maybe might help with my psychology programs and things like that um, so that was definitely what I was thinking about. And then also the fact that it's in French, I still want to keep my bilingues, my guess. Um, so I guess that's what's helping. Obviously, if I'm going to be um, a psychologist or a therapist or whatever it is I'm going to be, I would like to do it in both French and English. So being able to continue to study psychology in French, um, I think was like one of the main factors. I was like, yeah, that's what I want to do. Because if I continue to study in English, then like, I'm just going to speak English forever. So yeah, definitely French was like a big aspect so that I can help like, um, you know, immigrants, things like that as well. Right. So, yeah. You'll end up like the rest of us. I had to take some French courses at UFC just to keep up the writing and everything. No, really I'm not doing that. <laughs> um, let's go next up. Papa Afo. Uh, experience between small school, big school, Alberta and Quebec, you have it all. Um, uh, what do you have to share about that? And then when you're finishing up, uh, were you looking at careers and 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 that kind of stuff since you're on the back end of your journey? Yeah, like uh, the big thing is like, because uh, like when I started, I started in, in uh, Alberta and I was going to Ambrose, which is also like a small school. 
and then like that was it was a big shift going from there from Ambrose to Concordia, which is like much way bigger. And uh, like what also resonated with me a lot was just still at, uh, at the start when we're talking about like clubs and stuff like that to be able to like make connections because that's what I did too. I started, I came here and I'm like new to Montreal, don't know anyone in the city. So it's like, uh, I was going through clubs that I, I started uh, making friends. And then, uh, yeah, and like, so, so like uh, another thing that's like, uh, what that kind of like, I really kept my attention was on the subject of like bursaries and stuff like that. Cause it's not a thing I really thought of much of and like looked into. Cause like I have my, I have I, Yana, Amy, all, all the other siblings to like help guide me on like uh, what to do in terms of like uh, student loans, doing the, uh, even telling me like about, about clubs and stuff like that. But like when it came to bursaries, we didn't have enough like uh, really guidance to like what, what that entails, how to make it work. So now I'm like, now I'm looking, I'm like, okay, that's something to like delve deeper into. And then I think uh, so there was one last thing I want to to say. I can't remember what it was, but that's that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when it comes back to you, just let, let me know. Yeah. And then over to Raisa. Raisa, the interest in internships and everything like that. Uh, where are you at in your career, and, and what's uh, what's with that interest level there? <laughs> well, I I sorry. Wait. Sorry, oh, uh, I did talk. I did talk to Kenty, but I wanted something that will help me grow with my career, and um, something like that includes social, child and youth care, something that has to do with the immigrant. I mean, the government. Sorry, not the immigrant, but the government. Something like that. And I just, I'm just looking for something that will help me grow. All right, good stuff. And I think uh, for the SOS side, I'll give the final word to Mama Carol. You're gonna let us know uh, the value of the education. She was she was in the grind with me. You guys don't know the working full time, going to school, all that stuff. So um, definitely had you uh, you see times, good times slash trouble <laughs> times. All that. Let us know what your experience was. Um. No, yeah, like I said, I, I went to school, I went back to school the first couple of years of my education, I actually did, um, you know, I was working full time in my early, you know, when you graduate high school, 18, 20s. So I would um, go to school to work full time and, and pay for my school, but it got increasingly hard. And, you know, then you get promoted at work, then you start taking uh, two classes at a time, then it's like one class a year. Um, and, you know, my advice to, to a lot of you young people is if you can try to do it um, when you're younger, <laughs> do it, get it over and done with. Because I went back to university in my late 20s um with a child and you know with all other responsibilities so yes I was still so I actually quit my job um completely quit my full-time job went back to school full-time for the first three years uh living off my savings but I got student loans and you know the 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 thing with student loans is after you're done school, you have to start paying it back and it's not always fun. So if you can get um, any kind of bursaries, um, scholarships, and it's it's something that I heard Afo say something that, you know, his siblings told him about, um, you know, about clubs, about, you know, what programs to sign up for. But one thing that he didn't hear much about was about bursaries, because we don't, uh, a lot of us don't really come from a culture that we we go look for those kinds of things. And you'd be really surprised how many of your peers at school actually have some sort of bursary. Uh, so when I did, when I went, uh, when I started my master's, uh, my university was out of the States. And so I was not, I was also, so I was paying in American dollars. So that was a lot of money. But then I come to find out that a lot of the people in my program were also had uh, scholarships. And so they started telling me, hey, there's some scholarships you can apply for. And trust me, I applied for 
all the scholarships that I could. Um, so I got a, par a partial scholarship for during my master's, but I still, even with that, um, the payment was still high because you're paying in American dollars for one and universities usually in the States tend to be a lot more expensive. So if you can get your hands on some of those uh, bursaries and some of those grants and try your best to get them because honestly, the student loan is helpful because a lot of us, yes, our parents are immigrants, so they don't have they didn't start a savings for us. You know, some of our, our peers, uh, their parents were saving for them since they were babies. So they're walking through this thing and not paying a dime because their parents have been saving. Um, and so if you can try to give that try your best, please, because paying off your student loan is not fun. It's not fun at all, but you know what? At least it is an option as opposed to you not going to school at all. Right. So um, there's also that. Uh, so there's yes, there's the positive side is that you do get some funding and you're able to go to school um, and you don't necessarily have to work uh, full time while you're going to school, because that's hard. That's very hard. Um, it, yeah, it's very, very hard to do. You're, and, and it also, you're not able to really be full, uh, you know, to take full time courses. Uh, and when you do, something suffers. Either your work suffers or your school suffers, and you want to pay attention to your to your marks not suffering, right? And so, um, yeah. So my advice would be try to get those bursaries as much as you can. Um, yes, if you if you have, uh, I mean, if you have, hopefully, with your younger siblings, if you have younger siblings, you know, talking to your parents about RESP, learning about RESP. My daughter has had her RESP since, RESP since she was born. And it's one thing that I definitely want to make sure that she doesn't go through. I will take care of her tuition. I'll take care of kids' tuition. Um, our parents didn't get the opportunity to do that because you know some of us immigrated here. Um, and so parents had to start over, right? So um, yeah. So my advice would be try to get uh, try to look into getting those loans, uh, those bursaries, sorry, and grants as much as you can. Your peers are doing it. It's not a shameful thing. Look for it. Look for it. Go on the website. See what you can get. As much funds as you can get uh, will be very helpful in the end so that you reduce the student loan that you have to um, to get. Sorry, it's getting dark here. But yeah, that's that's it. No, uh... Thanks for that, Carol. Uh, Raisa in the chat says, that's interesting, Carol. Thanks for the advice. And I think we have Jamima raise her hand. Go ahead, Jamima. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that I was actually really scared of getting like, uh, like applying for student loans uh, just because I have three older siblings and I've heard a lot about, you know, paying back and how years after stopping school, I'm like, no. <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> so for a really long time, I was like, no, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna work. I'm still planning on working um, during school. But um, when I did apply for student loans this year, I realized that they actually automatically gave me a grant as well. And it's actually more than the loans, which was shocking to me because when my mom explained, she's like, oh yeah, that means that the grant is a grant and then the loan is what you're gonna have to pay back. And the fact that it was more than the actual loan, that's what I was like, oh, okay, so it's not that bad. Um, so it's a lot less scary seeing that, okay, loans are not just like, you're gonna pay back 1100 plus more for all of your years of university afterwards. They do automatically um, give you grants as well. So I just wanted to add that, that I thought that was pretty cool when, um, when I saw that. Yeah, and whoever tries to pull off those schemes, like, you're gonna get student loan, then get a credit card, pay your student loan with the credit card. Don't do it. It's a Don't bad it. idea. It catches <laughs> up to you at some point. It's all that. Um, but I think um, that's our SOS people. So thank you so much. Round of applause for Camille. Thanks for coming through, presenting for us. I think we can pass it over to Nketi and Rita, and then uh, we can wrap it up after that. Right. Thank you so much, Camille. This is stuff that I would not have been able to do by any stretch. And so thank you, thank you, thank you very much for your insights. And obviously for the information that you provided that is Calgary specific, but can also be applied to the university journey in general. 
and I think the content, um, Carol and I providing the, the context specific stuff is also really important as well for the young people. And I think, yes. And so with, I think a few of you missed the beginning where I spoke about your assignment. Um, do check the recording and I'll also send the slides as well. And um, yeah, I think that's it for me. Rita, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, well, I did come in late, so I'm not really sure where my contribution is going to fit into um, everything that happened. Um, I do apologize uh, for coming late. Um, I have a new schedule, and that new schedule is, is very different. I don't control all of my hours, so sometimes it just I just try um, as much as possible to not um, be leaving this program at the back. It's so high on my, in my heart and on my mind. Um, having said that, I think, um, Camille, you have given um, our participants lots and lots to chew on. Um, and I think the reason we put together this particular um, topic was to the point Carol was making earlier. So people know what to explore um, and not be burdened um, with loans or be burdened with questions around how do I get um, um, tertiary education. Uh, my only two cents are two things. One is that Camille has spoken at length about the University of Calgary, but this should be participants, your springboard for exploring other universities out there or other tertiary, let me say, um, you might be wanting to go to, to state, for instance, their template is pretty much the same. They have um, sort of organized into, on their website, you know, what is on offer, and every university has some sort of money that they are giving. So try to expand um, what you have learned here beyond the University of Calgary. The other thing that I was thinking about is, around how to position yourself to get these monies. I'm pretty sure um, many of you are involved in something. It's either maybe music or dance or sports or some volunteering. We really grow that portfolio because that is what is going to help you beat the competition. Everyone that is applying for a scholarship has good grades. So don't rely on your good grades alone. You need to have something extra that allows you to edge out your competition. So every little thing that you do, um, even taking care of your siblings at home, um, volunteering at your church, doing some uh, drive in your community, all those are things that make the scholarship people think that you are community minded and they are much more interested in finding a person like you, as opposed to somebody who has just high grades and all you have to show is high grades. So look for those things to really show up your chances of getting these funding opportunities. Last year, I was thinking about networking. I think that's the point at which I joined. And I was hearing something about um, um, networking, um, maybe internships. And I was just thinking about the networking. I know that there are students who are in high school that already begin contacting professors in universities just to see what is out there. Most of these professors are already scanning the horizon for who um, could be the next person on their team. Um, so let's say, Raisa, you are asking questions about internships and you are interested in kinesiology or something like that, go on to that website and just look. What are the professors there doing? Does it interest me? And email the professor, hey, this is who I am. I'm just kind of exploring this area and I'm wondering if there is any way I can come under your tutelage and be some kind of an apprentice. Um, and most profs will give you a chance to come and then you grow that relationship on there. That alone will give you something to put on the application when it comes time to go to university. <laughs> So these are small strategies I just wanted to kind of highlight uh, to help you really get into that um, scholarship mode, beating out the competition, and essentially having you know, scholarships and bursaries pay for your university education because it is doable. 
Um, you just have to know the strategies to, to put in place to make sure that you get these little money over here. 500 here, 200 here, 300 here, 400 here, before long you have $2,000. That's what people do too. So don't also be wanting to get a big one. You can cobble several together and pay um, your, your way through university. So this were just my two things. And again, I'm sorry for coming late. Okay, um, I think that's everything. Really strong session. We had a bit of a break. We're coming back like this. So it's good, good to see all your faces, everybody. I did miss you guys. Uh, so I think that's all. We'll see you guys next time. All right. Thank you, I Thank you. Thank you, Camille. Thanks, Thank you, Camille. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Good day.